get back to them. Father, I just know that you've heard each and every request that's been lifted up in here, Father. You know the need, and you will meet them right where they're at, Father, that they would just trust in you and know that they can crawl in your lap with your unconditional love yes. and receive it. And Father, um, just thank you for each and every person here that's been seeking you more, that uh, let them open their heart to receive, because you have a message for each and every one of us. And so, Father, we just love you for that, because, um, man, if we just draw close to you, you'll draw close to us. And uh, I just appreciate what you put on David's heart today and, and the way you're going to unfold that. And uh, let us receive that. And, Father, uh, as we enter into the holiest, the holy of holies, Father, yes. as we worship you, Father, uh, let us do it without any regard, without any focus on anything else but you and you alone. Father, let us drop everything at the foot of the throne of grace, Father. We thank you for loving us and let us honor Magnify and glorify your name and all that we think, say, or do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us worship. <clears throat>
situation. You have proven yourself faithful. Yes, thank you. When others around us are not, you remain thank faithful you. through it all, Lord thank Jesus. You. Thank you, Father, for your love, thank you. your mercy, thank your grace, your kindness toward thank us. You. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Holy Spirit. Oh, we praise your name. Worship. Because in the midst of it all, we can count on you. Yes, yes.
just as you sing the words of this song I want you to see him sitting on his throne I want to see the love from his eyes coming to you from the throne of God right now because I'm telling you that's where he's sitting right now as our advocate he is sitting there with the father he's sitting there for us See him sitting in that place looking upon you. Look at yourself before him right now. And as you sing this song, you sing it like you've never sung it before because you will Ooh, see you. in the spirit realm like you've never seen before as we sing this song.
keep hearing this word. Just don't get distracted. Keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus said, keep your eyes on me. Nothing else. When the storms of life come, and they will come, he said, keep my hand in your hand. And he said, and I will take you through the midst of the storms. And we will come out on the other side victorious. Because he that is in me is greater than he that is in this world. He says, you're more than a conqueror because you're in Christ. That there is no fear in love. That when we are perfected in his love, there is no fear, no anxiety. Just sweet, sweet peace. The joy of the Lord is upon us. Allow the Spirit of God to minister to your hearts right now that any distractions that you may have, anything that's going on that's outside of where we need to be focused on, and that's <coughs> Jesus. Just let those things fall away. Fall away. Because he just wants our undivided attention in this moment right now. He says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Are you hearing his voice today? God loves us so much. He just wants a family. It's so easy to be distracted the things of this world, to get preoccupied, to even begin to compromise sometimes the truth of God's word. Jesus said, I come for no compromise. I come for truth and truth alone. He says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See him as who he is. See him seated on the throne of your heart in that holy place, in that place where he lives inside of us, that we are the temple of God, that we have the Holy Ghost in us. Know that he wants to have that intimacy with you and I today, and not just today, but every day of our life when we wake up. Tell him, Jesus, I love you every morning. And he will tell you back, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. And today's going to be an awesome day when we can walk together in it. Just know how much he loves you. Know that he loves you. As we sing this song, see him seated where he needs to be seated. And that is in the holy, holy place of your heart as we sing.
understand how much I love you. It's just the love I have for you is there can be no measure to it. You can't even put a measure to it because it's oh so, so much. And the reason why I just love you so much is because you could have had all the judgment. You could have had all the infirmities. You could have had all the sin placed on you. But instead, I sent my own son to be take all those burdens upon himself. And that is, that is the reason and the biggest reason why that you can know that is, oh, so how much I love you. And it's just so, there's just no bounds. And there's just, it's just out of this world. It's beyond what you can even think or imagine. And just know that I love you so, so much, your Heavenly Father. And just treat every day as Father's Day with me as your yes. Heavenly Father. Yes. You can trust me, says the Lord. Since I formed man, man has been placing their trust in me. But then things changed. So I'll tell you today that you can trust me. Earthly fathers may have let you down. They may have even done harm. But I am faithful, and I am good, and I am loving. And you can place all your trust in me. Yes. For I love you with a deep love. And there is nothing you have done that changes that. So come back to the fold. Put your arms around my neck. And let me love on you. And show you how great a love I have for you. Mm. Father. We are grateful for the sweet, sweet spirit in this place. We are thankful for the presence that you have allowed us to experience. I thank you for every single person that's in this house today, those that are online. And Father, that Lord, as we break the bread of life, Allow the word to go deep into our hearts and to our minds. That, Lord, that we can be changed from the way we came in. Help us to always grow in you. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. I'm just the facilitator. Teach us what you would have us learn today, Father, about the prophecies in Daniel. Again, we love you and we thank you. And it's these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to welcome everybody in the house, everybody online, pastors in India, pastors in Pakistan. Thank you for tuning in. And while I'm thinking about it, um, Josie had sent me a message about keeping Wesley in prayer as uh, they were doing some work up in the uh, tribal areas up in northern India. And uh, he had some type of uh, muscle spasms or something going on because they, they do a lot of walking through the jungle uh, when they're going up to these tribal areas. And uh, they, carry, they carry food and Bibles and things like that up into the tribal areas. And so let's keep uh, our brother Wesley in our prayers. As a matter of fact, Josie, Wesley, if you're listening, uh, we're going to come into agreement right now and pray for Wesley right now. Father God, we just speak over Wesley's uh, body right now that, Father, that, Lord, that we pray that these spasms to be gone, that whatever the symptoms are, the conditions that's going on in his back and in his legs, Father, that we command these spasms to be gone in Jesus' name, that, Father, as we are speaking the decreeing, Psalms 107.20 says, we are sending God's word. And we're sending it to be yeah. him to be healed in Jesus' name, yes. and it will not return back void. That will it will accomplish exactly the words that we're speaking right now over Wesley's body. We just love you and thank you for the power of prayer. We love you and thank you for the opportunity to decree a thing collectively as a family. Even as we're thousands and thousands of miles away, we know the word has become effective right now in the life of Wesley right now. Thank you, Father, for what they're doing in Messiah Messengers of India and the ministry that they have over there and taking care of the widows and orphans and, and spreading the gospel throughout that part of India. 
We love you and thank you for these things. And the people said, Amen, amen and Amen. All right. So as we uh, get into the book of Daniel here again, we're going to be focusing on the last, uh, I, believe, I believe it's the last uh, four chapters. As soon as I get this pulled up here, uh, I'm going to kind of do just not, not a real heavy review, but a real quick one because I want to really get into the meat and potatoes on this. So actually, we're going to be, ma'am? Hurry. Hurry. <laughs> meat and potatoes. Yeah, I got to hurry. So in verse 24 uh, of, of uh, Daniel chapter 9, it gives an overview and an outline of the 70 weeks. And I like to say 77s are 490 years. We, we talked about some of the, uh, the way that's being calculated. And of course, verse 25 talks specifically, this is what Randy asked about last week, the 69 weeks. And we're going to be getting into verse 25 and the 69 weeks. And in verse 26, there is a gap or an interval that we're going to be dealing with in verse 26 alone. And, and in, then in verse uh, 27, we deal with the last week, or the, what's called the 70th week, known as the Great Tribulation, which is divided up into three uh, or into two parts, the first part and the second part. And so that's kind of an outline that we have here that we're moving forward. And, and so everybody good? Remember, we read this last, last week. And in Daniel 24, it outlined the 70 weeks of 490 years that determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make a re reconciliation for iniquity. And of course, you know the rest of the scripture there. So I ask these questions. To finish the transgression, has that happened yet? And we agreed, not yet. The transgressions have not happened. All you got to do is read the news. And you can see the transgressions is still happening. To make an end of sin, has that happened yet? Sin is still going. So we know that there's parts of this prophecy that has not yet happened. But what about make the reconciliation for iniquity? And we agreed that when Jesus died on the cross, he made the reconciliation for iniquity. It speaks about that in Isaiah. It speaks about that in, in the New Testament because he reconciled us back to God because of our sinful nature that we had. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that, Therefore, if any man be in a Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. The, the, the old thing that has passed away is when we get born again is our sinful nature, the old man that we once were. You no longer have that sinful nature uh, dwelling inside of us. As a matter of fact, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, I think it says, or 2 Peter uh, 1 says that we have the divine nature. We have been partakers of the divine nature of God. And people say, well, why, why do I still have this sinful thing going on in my head? Because you have not reprogrammed your mind. You still have programming that has been done in your body and in your soul, and your mind with emotions for many, many years. And it's all about Romans 12, 2 becoming effective, which says, Romans 12, 2 says, Therefore, it says, be not conformed to this world. Be ye tra uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as we renew our mind, our mind is being flushed out from the old sinful thinking, no, no longer a sinful nature, because that sinful nature died and it went away. The old man died. And now we have the new nature, the divine nature. We have Christ living in us. And so this is the thing about the reconciliation for iniquity. When that got done, we now have the opportunity to be born again, to not only be born again, but to also begin to renew our mind with the Word of God to where our soul, our mind with emotions can line up with the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost in me, to where now my body can become a living sacrifice, as Romans 12, 1 says to do. And so, huh? To be righteous. To be righteous. Titus 2, 11 through 15 is one of those scriptures of our anthem. Uh, Titus 2, 11 through 15 says that the salvation of God has appeared to all mankind, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and perfect in this present world while we're looking for our blessed hope and our great God and Savior Jesus, who died for us and took away all of our iniquities and has made us a peculiar people. And it says to go ahead and to rebuke, basically to preach this and rebuke with all authority uh, anyone that comes against you. So in other words, we have the authority to tell people about the gospel, to tell people about the reconciliation of, of uh, the word of reconciliation, the reconciliation of, of mankind to God, and to basically do it with authority. Amen? Bring in an everlasting righteousness. Not done yet. 
seal up the vision and prophecy. We're unpacking the vision. We're unpacking the, the prophecy. And then anoint the Holy of Holies. Of course, that is not done yet because there is going to be a physical temple, a third temple. Talks about it in Ezekiel. A third temple to be built where, uh, of course, the Antichrist, we're going to talk about that later. He's going to come into the Holy of Holies and desecrate it. But when Jesus comes in, it will be anointed by him, Messiah's king. Amen. Everybody good? We're kind of still reviewing. Okay. So what is a week? What is a week? The Hebrew week... And if you look at the Hebrew word, H7620 is from the Hebrew concordance, it's Sabu, a period of seven. A heptad is seven of years. Okay, a heptad is seven of years. A period of seven, it could be a, se a seven days, seven weeks, or seven years. Okay, and so I'm not going to go in and read these, but this is, this is a reference that I give. So the, the days... For Sabbath, on the seventh day, of course, Genesis 2-2 and Exodus 20-11 gives that period of seven of seven days. And, of course, the Feast of Weeks is outlined in Leviticus 23, 15-16. So we have the Feast of Weeks, okay? So we have a period of weeks. And then of months between Nisan and Tishri, those are months in the Hebrew calendar. That's actually seven months in between Nisan and Tishri. And it outlines that in Exodus 2, uh, 12, 2, and Leviticus 23, 24. And of course, the, the sabbatical years is what the Jewish people did not do uh, and what caused them to go into captivity uh, by the Babylonians. And that's outlined in Leviticus 25, 1 through 22, of course, 26, 33 through 35. And you see uh, all the outlines for the sabbatical years. Everybody understands that the sabbatical year, year, sabbatical year, God told the Jewish people, he said, you farm your land for six years, okay? And on the seventh year, you do not do any farming. That's the Sabbath year. The Sabbath year was not for the Jewish people. The Sabbath year was for the land. You know, farmers back in the day, they used to rotate their land and crops, right? Back in the day, I know my grandfather did. He had 25 acres. Sometimes he'd plant corn in one place, and the following year he may plant peas. Peas always put the nitrogen back in the ground, is what it did. Peas always, so anytime you needed, anytime he was seeing where his, his uh, corn leaves were yellowing, he would plant peas there next year to put the nitrogen back in the ground because the nitrogen is what puts the green back into the leaves. And so rotating crops, right? And so this is what God was telling the Jewish people to do that they did not do. And that's the reason why they went into captivity. So I have a question here. What is a decade? Huh? Ten years. Ten years. Why didn't I say ten years? Because a decade is a term that I want to tell you. It's just like the Jewish people saying a week. Well, what, what are you talking about a week? Are you talking about a week of weeks? A week of years? What are you talking about? Well, a decade, when I say I'll be back in a decade you know that I'm coming back in 10 years. So from a Jewish culture standpoint, when you're talking about weeks, you need to understand in context what weeks they're talking about. And this is very important to understand from a, between a Western culture and the way a Jewish piece, person thinks because they think differently than we do from a perspective of what God's Word says. Do y'all get that? Okay, everybody good? We're going to move forward. 70 years of captivity for not keeping 400 and 90 sabbatical years okay it was 490 years god says you owe me 70 is basically what he was telling the, the the people of captivity if you look down here at the last bullet point second chronicles 36 21 to fulfill the word of the lord by the mouth of jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her sabbaths whose sabbaths the land the land had enjoyed her sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate she shall keep sabbath to fulfill Three score and ten years. Three score is sixty, ten, that's seventy years. So that was what Jeremiah was basically prophesying over the, the Jewish people, basically saying that because you did not keep four hundred and ninety listen, they went four hundred and ninety years without keeping a sabbatical year. Four hundred and ninety. And God <coughs> says, You owe me seventy back. And that's and that's basically and that's basically what he did. Okay? Everybody good with that? Everybody understand? Has nothing to do with some of the prophecy we're about to talk about, but it, but in a way, in a way it does. Okay, let, let yeah, okay, yes, Lord. So let me let me say this. God always gives us foreshadows yes. 
of things in Scripture, of things in the future. You understand? So they didn't keep 490 sabbatical years, or, or 490 years, they did not observe the Sabbath, okay? And basically what he's saying, you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. Now let me ask you this. If God, if you got a prophecy from Jeremiah, which that's where it come from, and he said, if you don't do this, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years, and then another prophecy comes out, would you be listening if it really happened? Of course it would. To me, as a Jewish guy, if, 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 I'm, if I'm captive in, in Babylon, in Persia, and for 70 years out of Jerusalem, and then all of a sudden I get another prophecy, I'm going to be listening. Because if that come true, if I live through that and it come true, that means this next prophecy is going to come true as well. That's where it matters. That's where it matters. God is not a man that he will lie. And we can, we, can, we can stake a claim in every prophecy that's outlined in Scripture that if it happened by the word of the Lord back then, anything in our future is going to happen too because God is not going to lie to us. It's just a matter of understanding the prophecy to the point to where we can see the, the handwriting on the wall, the things that are coming. You get that? Did you hear what I just said, the handwriting on the wall? Where did that term come from? Uh, huh? That's the end of the uh, 70 years. Sir? Many, many people have parsed this letter that the, the king's sons were uh, desecrating the temple mm -hmm. and the writing on the wall indicated you're being judged in your time of that. The handwriting on the wall. That's so where it comes from. That was the very end of the 70 years we're talking about, 539 BC. Sir? That was at the very end of the yes. 70 years we're talking about, 539 BC. 539 BC. That's correct. Came That's right. That's right. All right. He's okay, Becky. He's okay. <laughs> All right, everybody good? Let's, let's move forward right here. Okay, so in Daniel, and I'll bring this out here in verse, in verse 2. I wanted to bring this to a point. Remember, Daniel was reading Jeremiah while he was in captivity in Babylon, which means when they took him captivity, he grabbed the most precious thing to carry with him. Do you know if somebody says, what is the most precious thing you have in your life? This is it. The word of the Lord. This right here is the most precious thing. If I'm, I'm telling you right now, you can ask Melda. I don't go anywhere without this. If we take a trip, it's with me. Uh, th this is the thing. I have, a, I, have a, I have a Bible in my phone, but there's something about the hard cover. There's something about the, the things I can write on and, yes. and things I can, it can jump out on me. You know, when I'm reading it. So this is the most precious thing that Daniel had with him when he, when he was packing his stuff up. And I think he was able to pack some stuff up. When he was packing his stuff up, he got the scrolls. And he brought them to Babylon with him. Go ahead, brother. Mr. Holding your hand right there is God breathed. It's God breathed. That's exactly right. It is God breathed. It's, that's, uh, was that 2 Timothy 1 through, uh, 3, 16, I think? 16. Yeah, and so it's, it's an inspiration of God. God breathed. Listen, this Bible, have you ever thought about this? This book was written over a 1,500-year period by 40 different authors. 1,500 years it took this book to get collected by 40 different authors. And it does not contradict one jot or one tittle. And it's for today. It's for today. It's, it's Holy Ghost, man. The Holy Ghost wrote this. It was just men that, that took the Holy Ghost and started pinning it. And you know what? You have the Holy Ghost in you, and you can do the same thing. You can pin God's words that download to you, and they can be used as prophecy. They can be used as edification. They can be used as encouragement for others. It's called words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of faith, because we operate in the gifts. You heard some of it today. You heard some of it today. All right. So Daniel had Jeremiah. And so Jeremiah 25, 11, it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. He basically told them. He said, look, you guys are fixing to get out of here. And the, and the, king, the king threw him in jail. Listen, the king that he was serving, the king that Jeremiah was serving, threw Jeremiah in jail because he said this. He said, you're nuts. 
Babylon is not going to do it. You're nuts. Guess what happened? Exactly what the word of the Lord said through Jeremiah. And he said, it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished, then I will punish the king of Babylon, which he did in that nation, says the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of Chaldeans, and I will make a perpetual desolation. So the thing about it is, we understand that Daniel was in Babylon and he was counting the years down. And he said, man, this thing's getting close. This thing is getting close to that 70 years to be fulfilled. And that's when he went to praying. That's why Daniel went to praying. He goes, what's next, Lord? He said, because I know when he was praying, and that's when Gabriel come. And if you read Daniel chapter 9, as we've done before, I'm not going to go back there. That's when Gabriel come to him, and he said, I'll give you an understanding of the matter. He knew that this 70 years was, was about to roll up. Because he was in his 80s at this time. All right? Everybody good? Okay. This is a, I'm an illustrative kind of guy. So I want you to look at this. This is verses 25 through 27 broke down. Okay, so we're about to get into verse 25, which is the 69 weeks. Verse 26 is the interval. It's the interval. And in verse 27 is the 70th week. Now I want you to pay attention to the interval. The interval encompasses when Messiah was killed, that's the cross. The temple was destroyed 38 years later. And then the church age. So we are still in the interval of verse 26 of Daniel. We are existing right now as the church in the interval of Daniel. 2,000 years later. Over 2,000 years. We're still in that interval. It's almost like... It's almost like time was going on and all of a sudden God, with his, with his big God finger, hit, a re, hit, hit like a, a, a hold button. Pause. Huh? A pause. Yeah, a pause. That's what he hit. He hit a pause button. And there's coming a day, and I think very soon, I think it's in Romans chapter 11, it says, Blindness in part has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There is a fullness of the Gentiles that are going to come into the kingdom of God. And when that happens, when the church age is fulfilled, God is going to go and time starts again, clicking away again. It's what happens. You have a question, William? No, no, no. Okay. So you understand that right now we're in the interval. So this is a very good outline to, to understand what happened in the interval, what triggered it. And we're going to talk about triggers, okay, in verse 25. Everybody good? All right, let's go. Okay, 69 weeks, verse 25. Here we go, Daniel 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score two, and two weeks. The street, I got it big, bold, highlighted print. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. Wow. Okay. And I, and, and I highlighted some things here on purpose. Because what, what Daniel just said, he said there's a seven-week period plus a 62-week period yeah. that equals 69 weeks. Yeah. And if you do 69 times 7, it equals 483 years of a 360-day period. Calendar. We're going to get into that a little bit more. So the trigger, the trigger point of this thing to start time is a commandment to restore Jerusalem, not the temple. We're going to talk about that here shortly. And the target is Messiah, listen, not crucified, but Messiah the King. Messiah the King. That's the target. And so... You get a good look at this. He said, this is, this is the angel, Gabriel, talking to, to, get, uh, to uh, Daniel. And he says, know therefore and understand. This is an angel of God downloading this information, this prophecy to Daniel, to where we can read it and we too can get an understanding of it as well. Isn't that good? That we don't have to worry about an interpretation. We already have it right here by an angel. 
I mean, I think this is phenomenal. People, people, there's too many theologians that make it too hard to try to stretch things out and they use big words about that long instead of just, look, let's just teach what the Word of God says and what the angel has said to Daniel. Okay? So, if you understand, and I'm just going to go ahead because Randy's probably going to ask. <laughs> what, what does the seven weeks have to do with it? That's a good question, huh, Dan? Huh? Go ahead, Becky. Let him go. That's amount of time supposed to the rebuilding. That's correct. That's exactly correct. Now that is not that is not a uh, that is that is a belief. That is what they believe. That time frame. Those are plans. Huh? Those are plans that they, they fall apart. That that's correct. So so the seven weeks and Randy said it perfectly. The seven weeks was a time frame in which it took to basically build. Uh, not only the, the walls, because we know that the walls were built in what, 52 days? I think it was in Nehemiah. Huh? I think 52 days it took to build a wall. But, but listen, they weren't finished with the streets. You see what I'm saying? They still had working to do inside. So this is the reason why seven weeks is estimated to basically get uh, Jerusalem back in order. Uh, you know, the temple was already rebuilt, Right. The temple was actually rebuilt before the wall was built. And the temple kept getting ransacked because they had no wall. They had no protection. So the seven weeks, it's speculation that it, that's what it took to not only get the walls up, but also get the streets and everything going because uh, it was destroyed. The, the uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. And so keep in mind, the commandment to restore Jerusalem is the trigger. And then we have 69 times 7. So if you, if you do uh, 62 plus 7, equals 69, 69 times 7, 483 years. Are y'all with me? Because seven more years would be how many? 490. 490, that's right. So we're talking about, we just talked about the 490 years. Now we're going to talk about the 483 years. Everybody good? All right, let's move forward. Okay, history of the decrees to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to give y'all the liberty to read these. But we're going to go into the one that matters. Okay, so Cyrus in 537 B.C. In Ezra 1, 1 through 4, he decreed to build the temple. Okay? In Ezra. He told Ezra, go build the temple. Darius, 519 B.C. Again, Darius was decreed to go and build on the temple. Because there were some issues in between Cyrus and Darius. Anaraxes in 458, talking to Ezra again, was still talking about building the temple. All right, and you, you guys can go back and read these things because I want to focus on the fourth one. Go ahead, Randy. That's what Robert Anderson talked about in the first two points. Of Sir? That's what Robert Anderson was referring to with the Cyrus and Darius. That's correct. That's correct. Which it was the temple, not, not, not the walls, okay? Not the walls and the streets. Keep in mind, we're talking about the walls and the streets. The temple was a completely separate decree altogether. And they were actually working on the temple before they had it fortified with the walls is what they were doing. Big mistake. But that's just the way things fell. I mean, we had good kings. We had Cyrus was a, get, a great king to spend his money uh, to manpower uh, uh, protection to go over there and to, and to work on the temple because... The temple was needing to be built according to uh, Ezra and others. Okay? So, which one is Daniel referencing to? And I kind of give it away. Daniel 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build, it, build Jerusalem unto Messiah. It doesn't say to build the temple. It says to build Jerusalem. So what I want to do is I want to turn to Nehemiah 2. And we're going to read through some of this right here. Okay? Just because it's some good good reading. And I don't have it in front of me. Does somebody have Nehemiah? You got it? Go, go ahead and read that uh, Nehemiah uh, 2, 5 through 8, and then uh, tie in 17 and 18 as well. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, The queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? 
So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me, the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter under Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me a timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertained to the house and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So, did you get out? Did you get 18? 17, 18? Go ahead. Then I said unto them, You see the, the, the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lie waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us fill up the wall of Jerusalem, that we may be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Now, what was amazing about Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a great leader when it comes to building the wall because what he did, he actually, let's say, for example, uh, uh, Nate, you, you, had a, you had a section of property in front of a section of a wall right here. This was your property, and that wall was torn down. And then you had the section over here. This was your house, and that wall was torn down. What Nehemiah did is he found the property owners around the perimeter. And he said, look, he said, we can work together. You build your part in front of your house. And this is how we're gonna build it. This is, we're gonna use the stones and the timbers and stuff. And so what Nehemiah did as a leader, he basically commissioned people that had interest in the wall right in front of their house. Brilliant, brilliant. Anytime you can get a buy-in and interest as a leader, you can get people's input and it, it'll be just like it says, let's rise up and build it. Let's go. Let's go for it. And so what they did is they basically commissioned the ownership of the properties around there and their friends. Hey, if you have a buddy behind you, hey man, help me build this wall because this is going to be our protection later. Mm -hmm. And they had a certain blueprint of the way they were going to build and everything. So you didn't build it your way, you built it God's way. Nehemiah was the leader of that. And it was absolutely a brilliant plan. And if you keep reading in Nehemiah, it talks about 52 days it took because there were so many hands on deck building it. Amen? All right. Everybody good? All right. Let's keep moving. So this is the one that we're focused on. Anoraxes 445 B.C. We read this already. Again, the city of Jerusalem was to be rebuilt with new walls and streets. The temple had already been built. Nehemiah gets the authority to build the city of Jerusalem. And that's exactly what he, that's exactly the authority he got from the king. All right, everybody good? So remember, 445 BC is the trigger. It's the trigger. Right, Randy? All right. I just want to make sure Becky, Becky's good back here. Becky, we good? 445 BC? All right. All right. So here we go. Here we go. So the 69 weeks understood the commandment to restore Jerusalem. So you had 69 times 7, 483 years to Messiah the King. The decree of Anorexes in, in March, and, and they had the exact date, March 14th. 445 B.C. 445 B.C. And uh, Nehemiah, we read uh, parts of that Nehemiah, didn't we, just now? We read verse, yeah, too. Yeah, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm, for the sake of time, look, y'all read Nehemiah 2, 1 through 18, okay, later on, because this tells the whole story uh, about the event that took place. But what I want to do is I'm going to pick up Robert Anderson's book right here. And in page 59, and I'm going to share something with you. You remember who Sir Robert Anderson was? He, he was a uh, Scotland Yard detective. He was a knighted uh, individual from the Queen. And he, uh, he went at this like a detective would, like for a murder. Yeah. I mean, that's the way he went at this thing. And he went back, and this book was written in uh, 1884, something like that. He wrote this, let me see here. 
1894, he wrote this book. And he had historical documents. He even went into Josephus and some other things. But he had some other history um, historians and things that he used. And so he, Sir Robert Anderson, is really a, uh, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he, he's really someone you can go to in understanding this prophecy because he spent so many years of detailing it out. Yeah. So I'm going to read this. It says, and this is on page 58 and 59 of uh, his book here, uh, the, uh, the Coming Prince. It says, Nehemiah mentions uh, Cheslu, which is November. Man, we've got to go there. Go, go to uh, Nehemiah 2 and read verse 1, Brian. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of, I don't even know how to say that, Ader, Aderixus, the yeah. king, yeah. that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Okay, hold on just a minute. Let me let me go here because there's a place that I need to go. I think it may have been in the. Uh, I think it may have been in the. Uh, I should have. I should have. Oh, I had my myself marked here. Okay, if you look in. Uh, in Nissan. Let's see here. I should have been better prepared for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1. Verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace. Okay. Right there, he gives the month that he was in Shushan the palace, and it was, it was what is called our month of November. That was Chislu. Okay. And it says, so Nehemiah mentions Chislu, number, of one year and following Nisan, which would be March of our calendar, okay? And you mentioned Nisan in chapter two, right? And it says, as being both in the same year of his master's reign, it is obvious that as might he expect to be an official of the court, he reckoned from the time of the king's accession, that is from July BC of 465. So this, there's historical documentation of when these kings went to office. I mean, he went back in the, in the history. So he knew it was, it was July 465 of the ascension of the king. It says, the 20th year of Artaxerxes therefore began in July of 446, the 20th year. So you're just doing the math from the time that he was ascended up to the throne, and then now he's talking the 20th year, so we know exactly the year. And it says, and commanded to rebuild the Jerusalem was given in the Nisan following. So it was a year before in November that, that uh, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 that he basically had a communication uh, with uh, the king or got a word from the Lord. And then from there, it was the following Nisan that he got the word of the Lord uh, from, uh, to rebuild Jerusalem. It says... Uh, this prophetic cycle is thus definitely fixed as in the Jewish month Nisan of the year 445. So Nisan, before the Jewish people started messing around with their own calendar, Nisan was considered the first month of their calendar. <coughs> and I don't know when it changed, but sometimes it changed to where now Nisan is no longer the first month because now they celebrate the new year and um, I forget the name of the month, but it's like in September where they celebrate the new year. So what I'm, what I'm stressing to you is this. 445 BC is a trigger according to historical documentation of when the king uh, made the decree. Is everybody there with me? Okay, we're gonna move forward. We good, Randy? Yeah. I might I might show it in the next slide. Okay. I might. Let's let's see if the next slide will show it. Okay. Maybe it maybe it's the next slide. So this is a calculation is based on a 360 day. That's a Jewish lunar calendar. It's not based on the sun. It's based on the moon. So you have Nissan 
is our march in April. Of course, liar, liar, however you pronounce that, April, May, seven, Tammuz, right on down through there is the different months with the with our with our calendar, okay? In Isaiah 66, 23, it says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come and worship before me, says the Lord. So it's not based on time as much as it is based on an event. The event is the new moon to another that happens 300, uh, that, that makes a 360 day calendar. You understand? That's a lunar calendar. Very important to understand because when we're doing our calculations, we have to do them based on the calendar of the Lord and not on the calendar that we use, which is called the Gregorian calendar. All right, everybody good? I'm gonna keep moving forward, Randy. Let's see if this will, okay. So 69 weeks understood. We have, we have 69 times 7. It's kind of a repeat. We have the trigger, commandment to restore Jerusalem. And then Messiah the King. Okay. Pray for that child. Because that's what it is. That's, that's okay. And so, and so you have 69 times 7 times 360 equals 1,000. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 173,888 or eight, 88, 880 days. Everybody got that? Otherwise known as 483 years, right? We do the math. This is the way it is. This is based on a lunar calendar, and it's it stems from the trigger point of 445 BC. Everybody still good? All right, let me move forward because it's going to get a little bit. A little bit more in detail. Okay, what I want to do, Randy, what was your what was your uh, question right there? Well, I just want to comment to that. If we're talking about 400 and... 445? 445, if we had the 30 years, 31 years, which gives us a total of 476 years. <clears throat> and if we convert those 476 years from a 365 to 365, that gives us 483 years. Oh, so you're so you're looking at when uh, uh, Christ was crucified? Yes. The cutoff. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're gonna and we're gonna get in. We're gonna get into that here. But the the more important part right now, which that's important, but the more important part is Messiah, the King. Yeah. This is where we're gonna go here. When did Jesus allow himself to be worshipped as king? Zechariah 9.9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly, riding upon a donkey and upon a colt or the foal of a donkey. So what we want to do, Brian, are you there? Matthew 21. Matthew 21, 1 through 11, and I want you to pay attention here to the reading of this. And then we're going to, I'm going to get into, I'm going to find over here Luke because this is going to be some focused verses as well. Right. Go ahead and read Matthew 21, 1 through 11. And when they drew not unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage unto the mouth of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. Saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you will, you will find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man says, You ought unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell you the daughters of Sion, Behold, thy king comes unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt and put them on their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before them that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. 
Okay, so Matthew has one perspective, but the perspective of Luke is where I need to touch base on because it, it Jesus actually makes some comments here that is very revealing. Okay, so I'm going to begin reading in Luke 19, uh, beginning in verse 28, and you'll hear some of the same verbiage uh, account that what Matthew did. So, and it came to pass when he came nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount, uh, called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. He said, "Go ye into the village over over against you, and the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied wherein yet never a man sat. Loose him and bring him here." And if any man asks you, why do you lose him? Thus say, uh, shall you say to him, because the Lord has need of him. And they were sent uh, and went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owner thereof said, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and cast their garments upon him uh, and the colt, uh, upon the colt. And they set Jesus their own. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he came nigh even to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole, listen, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory to the highest. I need to stop right there for a minute. They were actually singing Psalms 118. Psalms 118, 26. They were actually singing Psalms 118 when Jesus was coming in there. Okay? Let me keep going. And some of the Pharisees, this is where the religious people started raising their ugly head. Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said, Master, rebuke your disciples. And he said to them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Did Jesus ever tell the people to stop worshiping him as king? He did not. <clears throat> Matter of fact, the Pharisees was demanding it of him. And Jesus never told them a word because he was fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. A critical piece here in Sir Robert Anderson's analysis of where we're going here. Now, this is the kicker. Saying, he said he wept over the city. This is verse 41. Saying, if thou had known even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto your peace, but now it is hid from your eyes. He pronounced judgment upon them in that moment. That was judgment. I want you to think about this. He said, I come here with a prophet saying that I'm coming as your king and you did not recognize me at the visitation that I gave you. And because of this, he said, this city is about to be flipped upside down and there's going to be a bunch of you die. That's basically what he told them. Read it. Read it for yourself. And when he come, he beheld the city and he <coughs> wept. He cried because he knew what was about to happen. He was crying over it. And he said, if thou had known even now, at least in this thy day, the things which belongs unto your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Yeah. Because you didn't recognize them, they're now hid from you. It says, For the day shall come upon thee that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and about and keep you on every side, and they shall lay thee even uh, with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee the one stone upon the other because thou knowest not the time of your visitation. He said because you did not understand the time of the visitation that was prophesied in Zechariah, this, this city is about to be flipped upside down and there will be over a million of you die when Titus 
comes against Jerusalem. Now I want to tell you something. This is some strong words right here by Jesus. This is some strong words. How much more right now do people in this world have an opportunity to know Christ and they're turning away from Him right now? Yes. Because I'm telling you right now, there is a judgment and a wrath coming that if people do not turn to Jesus, they will experience destruction. And not only destruction, but eternal damnation in a lake of fire. And this message is not preached enough. Because we're running, we're running on time right now. We're running short on time. This is why it is so important for us to, to tell people about Jesus. Because right now, the visitation that is happening in our world today is happening through you and I. The Lord is visiting people daily. Daily, through you and I. The visitation is happening daily. And when, when Jesus said this right here, he said, because you did not see it, you have been blinded. Now, let me ask you this. It was 38 years after Jesus died that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, when this happened, how many went back and read Zechariah and came to you. And he said you'll see them in heaven. Because for 38 years. This prophecy rung in their ears. Jesus prophesied. That this city is going to be flipped upside down. And they're going to kill you. Your enemies are going to kill you. And it's estimated that there was over a million Jewish people killed in Jerusalem only. That ain't talking about the out of line areas like Masada and different places that they come against. Is that two thirds? Hmm? Two thirds of Israeli people? Well, that's going to be that... at the end. Oh. That's going to be at the Sorry. end. Zechariah. But, but this is the thing. There was, there was a lot of people killed there. And it's all because he said, and these are the words. He's, these are the words. He says, Because thou knewest not the time of your visitation. You didn't know it. You didn't see it. You didn't recognize it. Man, this shook me to the core when I read that. He basically pronounced judgment on them. He actually pronounced judgment before the cross. I want you to, I want you to think about it. After the cross, after the cross, Jesus took all judgment, did He not? But prior to the cross... He pronounced judgment on his own people. Yeah. That's stout, buddy. Ooh. That is stout, stout words. Ooh. It was an eye opener for me. When I was reading this, I went, Lord, help me to be a better manager of your word. Help me to be a better witness of what you've given me. Help me to be a better disciple to tell people about this. Because when I saw this, I said, man, time is running short. It's shocking, isn't it? Do y'all see what I see here? Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are y'all are y'all seeing it? No. I got ghost books on the goosebumps. That, that references Galatians six seven. Huh? I said that also references Galatians six seven. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. Okay, so let's talk about that. The spiritual law, the spiritual law of sowing and reaping, is just like the physical law of gravity. If me and Nate get up on that roof, we jump off, we hit the ground at the same time. Even though he's a little taller than me. <laughs> he may hit before this. But gravity works, right, Nate? It works every single time. The spiritual law works every single time, too. It's not God whacking people. It's the spiritual law that's in effect mm -hmm. after the cross. Because the judgment happened to Jesus hanging on the cross. He said, if I be lifted up, I draw all, and there's the word men is an italics, which is wrong. If I be lifted up, I draw all judgment unto myself. And that's what he did. If you read Isaiah 53, all the sins of the world, all the sickness of the world, everything was placed on Jesus that said that, that he, they couldn't even recognize him. His visions didn't even look human anymore. 
And as a matter of fact, if you think about it, when he, when he was on the cross hanging there, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he say that? Because for the first time in eternity, Jesus himself was separated from the Father in the spirit realm because of sin. That's why he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the Father had been watching over the Son when the sin got so impregnated in him and involved in him, the father went and had to turn his face away from his son and he separated from him spiritually. And that's when Jesus cried out. And you know, I'm glad he did because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. He was left and forsaken for you and I so that we would never experience that. Kathy? And that is because he bore our separation. What would have happened to us? What there? would have happened to it us? It was not just that he had sin on him. He bore the separation also. That's what correct. What happened to those that don't receive him? For those that don't receive Christ, they will be eternally separated forever. Forever. That's why it's important for people to come to know Jesus as their Lord. Amen? Yes, ma'am. So when is uh, Zechariah 14, 12 to 4, uh, 16... Still what does it say? Zechariah 14, 12. Is that where two-thirds are going to be killed? Uh, when anyone who waits war against Israel will, will be standing and their flesh will rot. That's, uh, okay. So that's in Zechariah chapter 14. If you put Zechariah chapter uh, 12, 13, and 14 together, it's really talking about after the millennial, actually through the millennial reign and afterwards. So that's... So, so at the end of the millennial reign, what happens at the end of the millennial reign? What's the major event that takes place? Huh? Well, the devil is loose for a season, right? I, I never have understood that. I want to ask God, why did you turn him loose again? But, but he's turned, I really do. I, I don't understand why, but okay, let's speculate for a minute. Can I speculate? So let's speculate. I believe the reason why the devil's turned loose for a season at the end of the millennial reign, it says to deceive nations, yeah. is because, think about it, we've been living 1,000 years without him. Yeah. All of mankind has been living 1,000 years. And I believe it's just another way of separating the sheep from the goats. Because generations that have lived that way yeah. that don't have any idea of no. what went on. No idea. And then when he's loose for a season... And he's coming to deceive nations. How many is going to fall into the God of this world again and be just annihilated? And just be annihilated. And look at the United States, and we're just how old? 200? 240, 260 years. And what's happened to us? We're just 200 years. So, so, Richie, what you say, flesh falling off the bone, it sounds like a nuclear blast, right? But it says that the word of the Lord, he will go. And with fire coming out of his mouth. Because remember the two witnesses during the tribulation are going to have fire breathing out of their mouth as well. But I think the word of the Lord is just going to speak. And the, and the armies that come against that I think will be led by the devil again. Armageddon. And I think the armies that come against will just be annihilated. And after that, it says a new heaven and a new earth will be made because the old one just got burned up. That's what it says in Second Peter chapter 3. And also in... Revelations chapter 21. Amen? Amen? Listen, I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm telling you this to prepare you. We're prepared for it. We ain't going to be here through a lot of it. Everybody say praise God for that. All right. Let's keep. Everybody good? Let's keep moving. Okay. Jesus allowed the Jewish people to worship him as king and the religious people through a fit. This is just a little bit of a review of what I just read. I'm not going to beat, the, beat a dead horse, beat the bush. Religious people considered this blasphemous to call Jesus Messiah. They basically said that he was blaspheming God. All right? So, let's get into a little bit of chronological of Jesus' ministry. Okay, and this is Sir, another one of Sir Robert Anderson's pet peeve of when did Jesus appear on the scene when did his ministry begin? Uh, when was he worshipped? Uh, and when uh, he was crucified? So, 
It's estimated that Christ's ministry began in the fall of 28 AD. 28 AD. And we know some historical evidence because Tiberius was appointed in 14 AD. We know that uh, August, uh, Augusta died in August 19 of 14 AD. All right, and this is all documented uh, within Luke. So uh, let's let's go to Luke right quick. Luke three one. Brian, go to Luke three twenty three. Yeah, I'm gonna go to Luke three uh, three one. So this is this is where he gets his his information right here to make this assessment. So Luke three one, it says. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, uh, uh, Caesar, Pontius Pilate, began governing of Judea, and Herod, being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of, of uh, Atura, and of the region of, I don't know what that is, and these other regions. Okay, so right here, it gives a time frame in which Tiberius, now, when it says that Tiberius was appointed in 14 AD. I want to I want to I want to play a little word wordsmithing on you. If I say, uh, like, I, I just turned 64 in May, but if I say I'm almost 65, what does that mean? That I'm in my 64th year going into 65, right? So a lot of times when they give dates, they're talking about that they're moving into that time frame. You understand? of when it actually was appointed time. And so uh, when they say that Christ's ministry began in the fall of 28 AD, he's pretty spot on with it as we will, as we will keep going on. But we see that Jesus' ministry began within the 15th year. Okay, that's what it says. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, that's when his ministry began, right? Because if we keep reading in uh, Luke chapter 3, uh, John baptizes Jesus. In the Jordan River. And if you remember, Jesus did not begin his ministry until what? He was baptized in water. And not only baptized in water, but he had the Holy Ghost come upon him. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed to Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power yeah. to go about healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. Yeah. God anointed him with the Holy Ghost and power. Yes. So why is this important for us to understand the importance of the, the, the uh, you know, when John the Baptist was baptized and he was baptizing with repentance, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when, they, when Jesus came, he said, there's one coming after me that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Mm -hmm. Holy Ghost and fire. Okay, so the, the baptism of the Spirit comes upon the man. Man, how can I say this to make it right? When you get born again, when you get born again, the Spirit of God comes into your spirit, born again spirit. We are a spirit, soul, and body. But when you're baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, the Spirit comes upon you. It comes upon my flesh, my mind with emotions. And it makes, I like to say it this way, it makes a Holy Ghost sandwich. I get the Spirit of God. I get the Spirit of God sandwiching me from the inside to the outside. And listen, when you get the power, when you get the power of God, when you see somebody that's sick or somebody that needs prayer, man, you get angry. You want to go at it like a bulldog. You don't want to slack up because Jesus never slacked up. Jesus went after it just like it was a life and death matter. And sometimes it is. Yes. Sometimes it is. And so when you see opportunity to pray for somebody, it's not my flesh that's praying for anyone. It is the Spirit of God that's rising up inside of me, and it's the Holy Spirit, the power of God. When I lay hands on somebody, it is the power of God that's coming out of me to do the work in that person to absolutely heal their body or to do whatever they need. It has nothing to do with David Bartholdi, my flesh, me, myself, and I, except I am a willing vessel to do what God tells me to do in a moment's notice. Brian. Somebody said, and this is something the Lord showed me. If somebody says they need prayer, that is a command spiritually to pray in that moment. Right now, it's a command. Command. When someone says, "Oh, would you keep me in prayer?" Let's go right now. Yes. 
I, I'm, and I'll pray for you later. But let's go. What, what is your prayer need? What do you need? Let's go right now. You see, prayer is something that when you're together with somebody, it says we're two or more together touching a thing, decreeing a thing. What's happened? There is power, collective power in there, especially if you're both born again. It is the power of the Holy Ghost inside of each and every one of us that comes up. And when it, when it rises up inside of me and my faith rises up in my soul, man, that is when signs, miracles, and wonders and healings begin to happen. Amen. Rivers of living water start flowing. Rivers of living water. So it's so important for the baptism of the Spirit to come upon us just like it did Jesus. And listen, it's not just a one-time event. Amen. You can get the baptism of the Holy Ghost in fire as much as you want. Yes. All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. I don't limit God for nothing. Man, I was laying on the couch this afternoon. I was praying in the Spirit. Man, as I was praying in the Spirit, I was so overwhelmed because I knew what was going to be happening today. And man, I, I began to weep. Kind of like I did earlier. You know, I saw Jesus sitting on the throne looking at me, smiling. Man, it overwhelmed me when I saw him. To see in the spirit realm, to see the things of God, when you're looking into the spirit realm, to be able to see these things, and it affects you so much to where, man, you're just overwhelmed. And I almost couldn't stand. Kathy heard me stop singing. She knew what happened to me. I was gone. She knew exactly what happened. I was gone. <coughs> I done seen it. Because I done said, see it. Use your imagination. See God sitting on the throne. See Jesus sitting on the throne looking at you with eyes of love. And if you ever get a glimpse of that love and get a glimpse of him looking at you and with a smile on his face, oh my gosh. Do you know that I am and you are the beloved of God? Yes. I am and you are the beloved of God. Praise Jesus. Man, we're his favorite. I say I'm his favorite, but you can say you're his favorite. Yes. You're his favorite, Nate. Yes. <coughs> Nathan, you're his favorite. Amen? Okay. Where am I at? Okay. I need to shut it down. I don't want to go any further. Randy, is this okay? Becky, is this okay if I... All right. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and sign off. Listen, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today on Facebook Live. If you have any questions or comments, I always write them in the comment section. And as we continue uh, going through these last four verses of Daniel chapter 9, we will pick it up next Sunday. Well, no, we won't. Because next Sunday, listen, y'all. Next Sunday, Brian and Tara will be doing a report out on the Philippines. So y'all be sure and tune in on that because it will also be running live on Facebook on the report out. Amen? So y'all tune in next week. And as always, Melda and I pray for you. We pray Third John 2 over each and every one of you. In Jesus' name, God bless you until next time. Amen and amen.